Uh, now uh, we have uh, Florence Negret, Professor Florence Negret, is going to talk to us about a subject I think dear to most of our hearts, the wonderful Juliette. Um, Florence, uh, we, all, we know very well, don't we? Um, she's given us such a lot of support over the years and we're so grateful to her and to Jean, who's always come with her. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Florence is a professor at Sorbonne University, a member of the Uni University Institute of France and of the Comédie Française Review Board. Florence Negret is the author of several books on the theatre, Romanticism and Victor Hugo. She's editor of the Digital Archive of the 20,000 Letters written by Juliette Drouet and has just published her biography, Juliette Drouet, Companion of the Century. I have to apologise to her, Florence, actually, because originally, when, when we looked at her, her um, talk, she wanted me to say that... Uh, uh, we wanted to say that Florence was the... I can't even... This is so difficult to say. This is why I said Florence. I can't say it. The campaigner's companion. And uh, <laughs> for us, it's a tongue twister. This is the thing. Campaigner's companion. It's very difficult to say. But that's because her biography is the companion of the century. Mm -hmm. And I, th I noticed you've done other talks which have, been the com the, which have been on that theme. It's fitted. But alas, I, because I can't say campaign is companion. <laughs> she had to forgo that one. So thank you, Florence. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Diana for my English text. Hugo the campaigner was not alone in his campaigns not alone, nor the first. He did not, in fact, invent any of the following. He did not invent free and obligatory schooling open to all children, nor the abolition of death penalty, nor the mitigation of harsh sentencing, nor the abolition of slavery, nor equal equality between men and women, nor the improvement of working conditions, nor welfare, nor the decriminalization of prostitution and of adultery for women, nor a national people's theater. He may not have invented all these causes which, with which his name is still associated, but he did espouse them and campaign for them loud and clear. He lent them his voice and that voice resonated far in space and time because it still speaks to us today so powerfully in fact that he is still often mentioned when those struggles have to be taken up yet again. His speech on education given at the Assemblée Nationale in 1850 contains an abundance of arguments as to how to differentiate knowledge from morality in the education of children and the young, and to separate clearly the respective functions of the state and of religion in the training of their minds. The founder of the Théâtre National Populaire, the National People's Theatre, Jean Villard, whom you see on the left, who put on two of Hugo's plays at a time including Rui Blas with very famous French actor Gérard Philippe in the 1950s. Jean Villard recognized that Hugo was a leading figure in high quality theater for all, a theater at the same time both accessible and challenging. So much so that he had even played with the idea of putting the motto Viva Victor Hugo, up in lights, above the entrance to his national uh, theater, Théâtre National Populaire. Another example. When in 1981, the death penalty was abolished in France, at the start of the presidency of François Mitterrand, Hugo was referenced as a pioneer of the cause. Incidentally, Robert Badinter, uh, whom we talked already this uh, morning, the Minister of Justice, who had pushed through the vote at the Assemblée Nationale, abolishing death penalty, wrote the preface to the last day of a condemned man in the popular Livre de Poche edition. In discussing forced 
child labor. People often cite a poem from the Contemplation called Melancholia, or sometimes one another from the Châtiment called Happy Life. When people highlight the paradox of prisons that only make criminals worse, they often use Jean Valjean as an example of someone hardened by his time in jail. In general, Les Miserables, that microcosm of a book, is a repository of examples, quotations, situations, and human models forever embodying Hugo's great, great causes. The denunciation of the exploitation of children through forced and unpaid labor. The politics of Bishop Myriel, who spends most of his household means on public welfare, education, and medicine. The vivid portrayal of society's underclass, which identifies poverty as the cause of crime and prostitution. For example, here, Eponine in Les Miserables, entering Marius' room and offering herself to him because of poverty, the poverty of her family that she can cope on with uh, prostituting uh, herself, which Marius doesn't accept anyway. This is on purpose for you to listen to me now. <laughs> when we bring up these causes, we turn to Hugo and then we, we turn to Hugo when we evoke these causes. And thus we base their validity on his authority. And because of this, we may think that he invented them. In actual fact, all the writers, all the philosophers, all the thinkers, politicians of the Enlightenment, or his contemporaries, had already put their minds to them. Rousseau, before Hugo, had demonstrated the importance of popular education on the journey towards democracy and had already, before him, proposed an enlightened system education for young children in his book Emile, or Concerning Education. Italian philosopher Cesare Beccaria, um, um, Miriam told us about, had already pleaded for proportionality in punishment for crimes and for the abolition of the death penalty. French philosopher Condorcet had already called for a national theater that educated and raised up the people. A doctor, Villermé, had already written an essay concerning poverty amongst the people and putting forward suggestions to reduce it. Great philanthropic patrons were already considering the necessity of improving working conditions for their employees, not only through Christian charity, but also to preserve their precious labor force and thus maintain the productivity of their enterprises. It was at the suggestion of the economist Adolphe Blanqui that Hugo visited in 1851 the cellars of Lille, the city of Lille in the north of France, where the underclass of textile workers was, was crammed into insalubrious hovels, the air foul and stifling. Without him, without Blanqui, Hugo would never have seen in person the magnitude of the scandal of what Marx called at the same period the exploitation of man by, by man. Hugo became more aware of these great causes, not only through his attention to the enlightened thinkers, the philosophers, the writers, the jurists and artists of the Romantic period, but also because of his close observation of the world. In his notebooks, and within the folders that provided the material for the creation of the composite volume known as Chose Vue, or Things Seen, he noted what he saw around him and which gave him cause to think. Human interest news stories, political trials, events in the streets, anecdotes from those close to him, his wife, his children, his friends, his servants, and his mistress, Juliette Redrouet, his life partner, whom you see here 
at the beginning of their, their relationship and at the end of their relationship a few days before her death and here at the time when she lived in Guernsey. She lived at his side for 50 years and was not only his muse, his support, his copyist and his comfort, but also his companion in all his campaigns. Juliette, the campaigner's companion, encouraged him in all his struggles by giving him her support. But she did more than that. She played a major part in awakening him to them. He had had a middle-class education and had been given the title of Vicomte, a noble uh, title. She came from the working class and she helped him gain an understanding of certain causes. <coughs> causes that her inferior status and her sometimes rather sordid experiences had caused her to come up against in her real life. I am certainly not claiming that it was Juliette Drouet who came up with Victor Hugo's political and social ideas. I simply want to show that because he loved her, listened to her, <coughs> observed her, and thought highly of her, this woman made him glimpse a reality he had not even suspected existed. This woman also told him of humiliations she had had to undergo, which could never have occurred in the privileged milieu in which he grew up. She reported to him the destitution the ordinary people in her circle suffered in their lives in Jersey, in Guernsey, and before in Paris. She encouraged Hugo to cultivate a feminine sensitivity for which his mother had already prepared him. She served as a model for several of the finest characters in his works, whom he enabled to speak with a voice that would normally be forbidden to them in the society of that time. In order to establish what influence Juliette may have had on Hugo, I will not indulge in speculation or hypothesis, just as I did in my recent biography of her, I will base my argument on tangible evidence, archives, and truthworthy sources. On Juliet's side, the 20,000 letters she wrote to him, which are published on a university website, and which, of which I am the editor, with the help of Gérard Pouchin, and the memoirs, the, the memoirs she wrote at Hugo's request, published by Gérard Pouchin. On his site, his complete works, his notebooks, and his letters. It's by bringing these two sources together and comparing them that we can work out pretty confidently how much influence Juliet had on Hugo when it comes to these matters. This influence was only rarely intellectualized. More often than not, it was based on concrete realities in that it resulted from the telling of personal memories, communicating other stories, and sharing experiences and emotions. The first concerns the improvement of children's living conditions. Juliette was still a baby when she lost her parents, who had been textile workers at Fougère, a small industrial town in Brittany. Fortunately, as she was the youngest of her siblings, she did not spend several years at the orphanage like her sisters. Instead, being taken to live with her uncle and aunt, whose surname she adopted, Drouet. Undoubtedly, the extreme poverty in which her family lived, seven people in a cottage of 27 square meters, and an epidemic which devastated the surrounding countryside, were the cause of the two illnesses which carried away her two young parents in a space of a few months. Juliette regretted all her life having no memory of her mother and father. She was one year and a half when the last of the two died. 
And she regretted also not to have been loved by parents to her. She regretted having, having been deprived of their love. After she became the partner of Victor Hugo, she began to undertake charitable work on behalf of orphans. For example, on the day of 1847, when she received a message asking for help for the young daughter of the actor who had first played the role of Don César de Bazin in Rui Blas, actor whose death had left the child an orphan, she wrote to Victor Hugo, the future of this poor little girl concerns me, and I beg you, as if there is any, ever any need to beg you to do all the good you possibly can, to be concerned also and to see what we can do for this poor little thing. When I think of all the poor children that God has condemned to live as orphan at the mercy and more often than not the savagery of random strangers, I feel terribly upset as I remember my own childhood. I do apologize for asking you a favor on behalf of this poor little girl. Hugo was very alive to the fate of the orphans and abandoned children. This theme can be found throughout his work. He created, for Juliette, rightly, the character of Jane in Marie Tudor, and abandoned chil uh, uh, this character, Jane, is a b an abandoned child taken in by an honest man. In the poem, The Poor People, written in Jersey in 1854, the fisherman's wife, Jeanne, upon entering her neighbor's cottage, discovers one rainy night a terrible scene of a mother dead of hunger while her children sleep peacefully in their cradle. I read it for you in English. I guess French people remember the French version. A woman immobile on her back, no shoes on, her gaze dull, a frightening air, a body. Once a mother, joyful and strong, the spectre of dead poverty with wild hair. What remains of a poor person after a long struggle? She let amongst the straw of the mattress her livid and cold arm and her hand already green hang. An aura came out of that open mouth from which her soul, fleeing, sinister, had led out that great cry of death which is heard by eternity. Near the bed where the mother lay, where, near the bed where the mother lay, Two little children, the boy and the girl, in the same cradle smiled as they slept. The mother, feeling death upon her, had led over them her shawl on their feet and over their bodies her dress, so that, in those shadows where death steals from us, they no longer felt the warmth growing less, and so that they would be warm while she was cold. Janie, the fisherman's wife adopts them without thinking about it, even though she and her husband don't have enough to feed their own children. And when the fisherman comes back from, um, from his work with no fish because the weather was terrible, he also adopts the children without thinking that he has no, not enough money. Uh, for uh, breeding his own children. Another poem that presents us with the same horrible vision, this time in Les Contemplations, same, re same reason, same result, is called Something Seen One Day in Spring. Here, four children, like Juliette, her brother, and her two sisters, are stumbled upon, this time by the poet himself. I read it in French first. Entendant des sanglots, je poussais cette porte. Les quatre enfants pleuraient et la mère était morte. La faim, goule effarée au hurlement plaintif, maigre et féroce était entrée à pas furtif, sans bruit, et l'avait prise à la gorge et tuée. 
In English, I pushed open that door. By their sobs I was led. The four children were crying. Their mother was dead. Hunger. A dazed ghoul, holding plaintively, thin and ferocious, had stepped in furtively, noiselessly, and had grabbed her by the throat and killed her. You notice two allegories. The allegory of the spectre in the first poem, the spectre of dead poverty with wild hair. Le spectre échevelé de la misère morte. And in the second poem, the ghoul, la goule, en français, that is to say depictions of hunger in the form of monstrous creatures that are both human and supernatural at the same time. These allegories of the spectre and the ghoul serve to condemn in poverty an element of barbarousness in which man plays his part. Rather than framing poverty as the will of God, as Catholic teaching would have it at that time. For Hugo, the abolition of poverty was not only an individual's responsibility through charity, it was also and especially society's responsibility through fraternity. Hugo personally joined the fight for social assistance for poor children when in 1948 he became the president of the Société de Petit Bourg, a philanthropic organization dedicated to helping the young indigent boys, the foundlings, the abandoned and orphan children of France. In Guernsey, as you know, he organized weekly dinners for poor children, Catholic and Protestant, and we have many of these uh, photographs upon the years. These dinners um, were organized by him, and he was helped by his wife, his maids, and eventually by Juliette, who encouraged him all her life to come to the aid of the disadvantaged. The photographs of the children, which he distributed and which were sold by the photographer, and which struck a chord not just with the local, but also the international press. These photographs were disapproved of by the Catholic faction, in whose opinion acts of charity should remain discreet and not be ostentatious. In Christian teaching, as you know, the right hand should not know what the left hand is doing. But this was precisely Hugo's aim and why he courted publicity for it, to lead by example so that it would become widespread and so that charity, a Christian value because it is undertaken for the love of God, would become universal brotherhood which is undertaken for the love of humanity. Another cause concerning children that Juliette brought to Hugo's attention was that of illegitimate birth. Juliette did not marry the father of her daughter, Claire, which she had had before she knew Victor Hugo with the sculptor James Pradier. And here are uh, two drawings of Claire by her father and a, a sculpture of Claire by another sculptor. Juliette didn't marry Pradier. What's more, she didn't ask him to marry her. It's not just him that didn't want to marry her. It's her that never asked him to marry her, preferring to live her life as a free woman in the romantic bohemian world. We don't know if Juliette modeled for him. Whatever the case, she survived as a courtesan and then became an actress and went on being a courtesan at the same time as she was an actress. And that is how she met Hugo in 1833. Pradier encouraging her to continue down this path in the arts and to look after Claire from a distance. Claire, who had been acknowledged by her father when she was two years old, 
was however repudiated by him when she became a young girl. Why? Pradier had married a woman, in between, who turned out to be unfaithful, and he wanted a legal separation from her. Separation, not divorce, because anyway divorce was not permitted at the time. But having an illegitimate child with Juliette was a handicap for him in his legal proceedings against his wife. For this reason, he asked Claire to stop using his name. Juliette was horrified because it was so violent for Claire to sort of lose her name. Napoleon's code civil was very harsh towards illegitimate children. Even in those cases where their father acknowledged them, they had no right of inheritance, while moral disapproval made life difficult for their unmarried mothers like Juliette. Juliette also often displayed solidarity with women who were condemned for having a child outside wedlock and with the children banished from society. For example, one day she received a death announcement sent by one of Hugo's female cousins who had deliberately left out any mention of her illegitimate half-brother on the card of announcement. She had not mentioned her illegitimate half-brother, even though he had been acknowledged by their father and given the family name. Juliet was livid and wrote to Hugo, telling him what she thought of his cousin's petty-mindedness. This turning your back on one's brother, even when dealing with a death, seems pretty harsh to me, and that's putting it mildly. My beloved... Let's love one another like the good and honest folk we are, and let's bless God. In Juliet's view, God understands the laws of love and parenthood better than does man. Hugo would go on to create a magnificent and poignant story based on exactly this motif. The woman who is looked down on for having an illegitimate child the story of Fantine in Les Miserables, a character that owes so much to Juliette, just as Cosette also, who is an orphan, owes so much to Juliette. So both the mother and child characters owe to Juliette. Fantine, a young and happy-go-lucky working-class girl, is abandoned by the young man whose mistress she is and whom she loves, as you can see on the right uh, side and up side of the, this drawing, uh, where she imagines herself with uh, her lover, who is the father of her little girl. But they are not married. And he, in order to make a good marriage and set himself up a middle-class life, leaves her without a thought for their little girl, Cosette. The first name, Cosette, which Hugo invented and which was not the first name, uh, uh, the usual first name, means little thing, Cosette, little thing, a name, because unnameable, barely human. Abandoned, Fantine leaves to find work in Montreuil-sur-Mer. Along the way, she entrusts her child to some innkeepers, the Thénardier, who go on to profit from the situation she finds herself in by blackmailing her and extorting all her savings from her. In the factory where she works, the intolerant supervisor learns that she has an illegitimate child and fires her for immoral behavior. This is the beginning of a long descent to hell, which drives Fantine to prostitution, poverty, and death. This is a drawing by Victor Hugo he intended to put at the front of Les Miserables. In 19th century society, I mean, if 
19th century society had treated illegitimate children differently, Fantine would not have been blackmailed by the Thénardier. She would not have been fired from her job. And she would not have been a prostitute, and she would have not, she would not have died. And there would not have been the novel. <laughs> <laughs> Hugo was aware of this cause and supported it, not only as a novelist through the characters of Fantine and Cosette, but also as a public figure. At the end of his life, as a senator, he supported the creation of the Society for the Protection of Illegitimate Children. This organization wanted to supplement the government's provision, which was limited to very young children only. Its founder, founder of this association, the feminist Louise Gagneur asked him for his backing, and he replied with an open letter published in the progressive newspaper Le Rappel. Madame, this concept is beautiful, and it is great. I agree with it, with all my soul before God, and with all my heart before mothers. Ah, oh, you are correct. Come to the aid of the innocents and the most hallowed of innocents are children. What you are going today, the state, ashamed to be failing in its responsibility, will do one day. For Juliet and for Hugo, protecting children also meant fighting against their exploitation. Juliet, who had a heart of gold, could not bear to see children suffer, abused, beaten. In Jersey, in the area known as Havre des Pas, where Juliet lived, her landlady at the Richland Inn, an old and cantankerous woman, had taken her orphan granddaughter into her service. Mistreated by her grandmother and aunt, just like Cosette by the Thénardier, Mary had become their whipping boy. Juliette confided in Hugo how sorry she felt for the child. My heart bleeds for this poor little Mary who cries of pain I have just heard and I fear for her that it is not yet over. The old woman has just run to find her daughter, that's to say to get reinforcements to beat this child, whose crime was not to have been quick enough, so it appears, to obey, to obey the old woman's orders. She was in the garden, hanging out her little dress for Sunday tomorrow, barely dressed and blue with cold. This crime will be punished by a hail of blows. I can hear her sobs from here which upsets me while she's shifting around and wiping down the tables in the bar. My God, they say that everything you do is good, but everything you allow to happen often seems contrary to reason and justice. Poor little thing. This is young to be starting a life of penance. Anyway, all this is distressing and causes me more pain than I can say. Juliette and Hugo took pity on little Mary. They, they nicknamed her privately the little Cosette of Havre des Pas, had a pretty dress made for her, and gave her a doll similar to the one Jean Valjean gave to Cosette. Juliette was all too aware of the problem of corporal punishment, which she had suffered as a child at the convent. She spent five years here at the convent in Paris, between the ages of 10 and 15, and had recounted her frightful memories. Hugo asked her to put down on paper her recollections of being a boarding pupil so that he could use these memories in Les Miserables for the episode where Jean Valjean and Cosette find refuge in the convent of Petit Picpus. Amongst the numerous punishments inflicted on the pupils, besides the whippings and the beatings, 
one of the most humiliating and revolting which had left its mark on Juliet, was aimed at girls who talked too much. They had to draw the sign of the cross on the ground with their tongue several times until their tongues were covered with lesions, with lesions, which did not stop them from starting to chat all over again straight away. Hugo reused this example and others provided by Juliet, and they fed into his chapter against the harshness, in fact, the brutality of practices in convents. The mistreatment that Juliet and her fellows suffered at the convent also included being forced to eat rotten food, being forbidden to receive presents from outside, humiliation, sleep deprivation, and lack of privacy. These were the prime cause of Juliet's anti-clericalism, a conviction she shared with Hugo. This anti-clericalism was independent from her religious faith, which it's itself was a very real one. The more she believed in God, the less she trusted, in his, she trusted his servants. She particularly hated the hypocrisy which drove believers to act against the very principles of their faith. After watching another new humiliation being inflicted on Mary, the little Cosette du Havre des Pas, the little girl's aunt having said to the grandmother, quotation, that it was her duty to throw the child out, out there and then that she wasn't well off enough, the grandmother, to house people who won't work for their keep. Juliet remarked, all this is a revolting display of inhumanity and greed. The devil take these Protestant humbugs. They are no better than Catholic bigots. <laughs> Juliet's memories of her years at the convent had left her with an abhorrence of the uh, mistreatment of children, of which Cosette, beaten, bullied, and exploited by the Thénardiers, is the symbol. She also held an unrelenting sense of grievance towards the church. Juliet's anti-clericalism grew stronger in the Ch Channel Islands, where she felt more under observation even than in Paris, and where Protestant intransigence meant that the illicit couple felt the full weight of harsh moral condemnation. Seeing Jersey women going to mass, she, she remarked, with some irony. I am watching the Jersey Protestant bigots go by, and I find them in every way the same as ours, like two beads from the same rosary, a rancid complexion, an expression desiccated as pumice, a stiff demeanor, with that narrow-minded and hypocritical thing about them that is exuded by all devotees of all religions. In the Channel Islands, Juliet dreaded the pervasive Puritanism, as here, when she wonders how she should introduce herself to Hugo's carpenter, whose services she requires in her own house. We need to agree how we handle this honest Guernsey man so that he interprets my proximity to and my exclusion from your house which is open to all and sundry, in the least worst way. Alice, it isn't enough to give your life, your heart, and your soul to the men you love. You still have to protect yourself from the prudishness, the stupidity, and the ill will of people, especially in a small place like this, where everyone rubs shoulders, watches each other, and belittles one another. There was a name for this insular puritanism, Kant, a word meaning hypocritical talk, humbug. Juliet made use of this word without translating it in the sense of gossip being judged, ill will. To protect herself from it, 
she preferred to stop visiting and attending gatherings, and even chose to turn down Madame Hugo's invitation to take part in 1864 Christmas party for the poor children at Hauteville House, citing in her reply to Madame Hugo her own solitary habits. What the term, what she termed her solitary habits, ostensibly the natural disposition of her shy character, simply met, meant the necessity of protecting herself from gossip, from prejudice. She hoped that death would free her from it, which led her to imagine the ideal social setup in the hereafter where natural law would, become, would come into its own again. I hope the prejudices of this world do not follow us into the next and that I can become a part of your family. You who are all my family, all my heart and all my love. Juliette fought injustice in a general way. Not only that of which she had been the victim, but also that which affected others. Her letters are full of calls for justice, which she calls on Hugo to witness against the misfortunes and mistreatment of the ordinary people of her circle, in particular, in particular women, children, the sick, the old, the destitute, families that could not rely on welfare to protect them and whom unemployment, sickness or the detention of a father, a brother or a son for political reasons, as happened for example during the revolution of 1848, might throw into poverty overnight. She does not stop asking Hugo to come to their aid, to put right the wrong that society inflicts on them without ever considering how to correct it. And more often than not, he does what she asks. Amongst those poor people that society drives to do wrong and then savagely punishes, we find prostitutes forced by poverty to make a living from their bodies, then condemned by a narrow-minded bourgeois society to moral censure, in even imprisonment. Juliette had experienced such a downward spiral in her youth. Becoming an actress had not protected her. On the contrary, in fact, since the majority of actresses sold their bodies as a second job. The protection and love Hugo gave her allowed Juliet to leave that life. She wrote to him in 1835, two years after the start of their relationship, Yes, we will stay together until our last breath. Yes, you will help me, and you will make of me a woman secure from poverty and prostitution. Yes, you will put me back to how I was before my fall, and what's more, a good mother. Juliette, who had told Hugo about her past as a fallen woman, saw herself in the characters of prostitutes and courtesans that people his pages. Marion de Lorme in the play of that name, Tisbe in Angelo, Tyrant of Padua, and of course, Fantine in Les Miserables. Juliette's testimony was not, though, the only source of Hugo's growing awareness of the problem of prostitution. He himself had transplanted to Les Miserables a scene he had witnessed in the street, the arrest by the police of a prostitute who had defended herself against an assault by a solid middle-class citizen. Horrified, because the police started on the victim according to the fact that she was a woman from the margins of society, rather than her attacker because he was a supposedly respectable man. Hugo had accompanied the poor woman to the police station, testified in her favour and obtained her freedom. This thing seen shows vu by him in one of the circumstances which gave him the idea of writing Les Miserables was to become the famous episode in which Fantine, attacked by a client who puts snow down her neck, feastily stands up for herself, 
is arrested by the police and defended by Monsieur Madeleine, alias Jean Valjean. A few years earlier, in the preface to Angelo, Tyrant of Padua, Hugo said he wished to defend women in society, edest wives, against marital despotism, and the woman outside society, edest prostitutes, against public contempt. He said he wanted through his play to restore the fault to where the fault lies, that is to say to men who are strong and to social mores which are absurd. When Juliet read, read this preface, she was passionately grateful and she wrote to him, I can find nothing in me except love for everything you say and gratefulness for the admirable work that aims to pick up the poor fallen woman and console the poor sacrificed one. If you go, as Agathe Giraud has shown us this morning, is such a committed advocate for the rights of women. If he denounces with such force the misery and injustice that leads the most vulnerable of them to prostitution, then Juliet has played a role in that. More generally, and without being overtly feminist, Juliet routinely pointed out to Hugo the injustices of which women were the victims. She didn't do it in an intellectual or vindicative way, but rather by means of compassionate pleading. In this way, she compared the unequal treatment of Hugo's grandson, George, and his sister, Jeanne, when only the boy was invi invited by his grandfather to a dinner given by the author of Hernani to the actors who revived the play at the Comédie Française in 1877, Juliet made this comment. You did a very nice thing by wanting little Georges to go to Sunday's banquet. It will be for him, even more than for everyone else there, a sincere, glorious and indelible memory. What a pity that his dear little sister is excluded from it because of her sex. Not fair. Juliet's feminism, then, finds its expression subtly, is, someone, is, is somewhat subdued and might appear paradoxical. So unequal was their relationship. He was in the light, she was in the shadow. He didn't have to answer to her for anything. She depended entirely on him. He was fickle, she was faithful. Hugo held the family in high esteem, but not so marriage. This mistrust of marriage led him to live his own out in a very free and easy way. The sexual freedom he allowed himself and which so upset Juliet, because she was not his only mistress, this sexual freedom he also granted, not Juliet, but he also granted to his wife. He never asked her, his wife, to explain herself to him, and he allowed her to return to Belgium and France when her lonely life in Guernsey became too much for her to bear. As for Juliet, she never demanded any man marry her. Not Pradier, the father of her child, as we have seen, nor Hugo, even when he became a widower in 1868. The rejection of marriage was an element of Juliet's feminism. This feminism was neither comprehensive nor radical for her. Indeed, she had deprived herself of her, own, of her own independence when she agreed to give up her career to devote herself to a man who kept her. This was for her an immense sacrifice and one she regretted all her life. But this choice to belong to Hugo was hers, voluntarily agreed. It was not ordered by the law. It was not dictated to her by the Code Civil, which had downplayed and legitimized what, what 
we call nowadays not conjugal duty, but conjugal rape. Juliet and Hugo had never bought into the idea that the monogamy imposed by the Code Civil and Christianity was the only acceptable model for a family. Why? Out of necessity, in the first instance, because their adulterous relationship was carried out in secret outside those relationships of Victor Hugo, which were officially recognized by society. Then, through Victor Hugo's opportunism, he ended up adapting very well to this two-household arrangement, his lawful household on the one hand, and his petit ménage as a second family was referred to, the one he formed with Juliet and Claire. In the end, out of conviction, when after the death of Madame Hugo in 1868, Hugo was a widower, neither he nor Juliet ever considered marrying. But they lived together at last. During the last 10 years of their relationship, they lived together. What Juliet wanted was not to be married, but to be loved. The greatness and the beauty of their relationship has to do with this choice they took to never make their union official, even during those last years when they lived together when Juliet was at last accepted by Hugo as part of his social life. This late recognition was such that Juliet's funeral in 1883 was almost a national event. The size and the quality of the cortege which accompanied her for funeral procession, the impressive list of illustrious visitors who signed the book of, condolence, of condolences this was the cream of writers, artists, academics, and politicians of the period, among whom were several former, current, and future ministers and presidents of the Republic. The eulogies, which came thick and fast praising, uh, which came thick and fast praising her goodness, her beauty, her spirit, her courage, her selflessness, her sense of sacrifice, and her devotion, shocked the conservative press newspapers whose title indicate a national meaning, le gaulois, le drapeau, the trumpet, le pays, um, the country. This funeral, conducted without a priest and all over the media, of someone's mistress who was to top of all a former prostitute, constituted an attack on public morals and on religion. Certainly, Juliet didn't want this publicity around her death. If she could have foreseen it, she would have been more surprised than anyone. But the posthumous glory following immediately after her death, which she had not, not sought, is a sign. Her relationship with Hugo, strong enough to resist all the contrary winds, was an important step to in our collective imagination, in these long fights still ongoing today. Equality between men and women, decriminalization of prostitution, tolerance when it comes to love and relationship and having babies, the protection of children and secularism. She was definitely the campaigner's companion, but the opposite is true also in all the causes I have spoken about, she also was the campaigner of whom he also was the companion.